I'm Ben Carcio, CEO of Promobox. Promobox is a brand to retail marketing platform that makes it incredibly easy for manufacturing brands to support their retailers. That's my elevator pitch that I learned. Um, Promobox, um, I'm going to actually have to come out and admit something that we're small. Um, we're a small startup. You know, and this, and this theme tonight is about small startups and big brands. Uh, and it's actually a really important theme for our company as a startup. Uh, and I think it's an incredibly important theme for this conference, because this conference is really about the future. And if brands don't support and have trust in startups, then startups won't grow. Because I, you know, I can imagine anyone that's starting a company or a big brand that works with a company, it's about trust. So we're going to talk about that through our presentation. Uh, but I want to talk about our first brand. Uh, how many people have used Barney Butter before? Used it? Eaten it? Uh, it's an incredibly small brand. So Promobox actually had to use a small brand in order to get to a big brand. But we went from Barney Butter to a brand like this. So it's a huge opportunity for us as a business to go from a small brand to a big brand. Uh, and a lot of things happen. Great team, trust, and I'm not going to steal the thunder from my co-founder, Sansire, who's actually going to go through the whole Promobox story. But this is the theme. Um, about how startups can support, I'm sorry, brands can support the startups in Boston and otherwise. Um, so, but part of the challenge for a marketing startup is a marketing startup, it's all about getting that brand traction and brand traction has to come first in order to create the startup. So it's, it's critical that brands and startups can align in order to kind of create these partnerships that can create big companies. But the problem is that brands and startups are a little bit different. So startups view brands really as this kind of evil entity that's just going to eat them up because they're massive, right? So Chevrolet, it's one of the largest companies in the world. It's massive. They could just wipe their hands and we'd just die off. Um, and then from a, from, a brand, from a brand perspective, they kind of view startups like this. And I'm not saying anyone in your portfolio, Redina, but startups are kind of struggling or they need money or they're desperate for work. Um, and as it turns out, a lot of them aren't. So it's really this kind of you know, change of perception. So when, so when the folks at Futurem came and asked me about doing a thing about startups, they said, well, let me pull some of these amazing companies that are working and doing amazing things with brands. So I went out and, you know, talked to companies that I know and that I've worked with and that I consider friends of mine. And these companies aren't just startups that are trying to find brand work. All these companies have worked with big brands and have gotten past that, that bridge that a startup has to do as a marketing startup to become bigger. Um, so I'm not here to bring a bunch of people that need brands. I'm actually here to bring you companies that have shown that, that they can do it. Um, companies here are some Boston-based companies. We have some companies coming up from New York, and we have one company all the way up down from Toronto or over from Toronto. Um, so like if you draw that on a map, it's like an isosceles triangle. So I'm going to create the silicon isosceles triangle. That's the new corridor that I've just invented right there. Um, so I'm going to actually go through each person. Each person is going to come up. It's going to be rapid fire, about five to eight minutes. Um, talk about a case study about a brand that they've worked with. Um, and then at the end, there'll be a panel and some questions. But I'm going to kick it off by, by talking about Adaply with AJ. AJ, why don't you come on up? Uh, I met Adaply through an agency down, down in New York. I think they're doing some amazing things with ads on Facebook. So I'm going to turn it over to AJ. And if you just give me a second, I'll bring your okay. presentation up. Sounds good. So elevator pitch is always the best thing to learn. Um, it's kind of like the first thing I always try to get salespeople to learn. It's like, how do you describe your company in less than five seconds? And I think it's so hard. Um, for our, our point, basically, our tagline is the easiest way to advertise across social media. And that's so vague sometimes that uh, it kind of confuses people. So I've definitely gotten five minutes in a conversation and someone says, what do you guys do? So. That might happen here, but I'll try to explain the best way. <clears throat> so the whole point of social is a hot topic, right? And two billion, oops, sorry, thanks. Two billion people kind of worldwide are using some type of social. You know, in the US, we're really focused around Facebook. And that was a year ago. Everyone says, oh, I do social, meaning they do Facebook. <laughs> God. That's probably my fault. There you go. So basically, uh, do I ever do this? Yeah. It's just like speed up. Okay, cool. Make it quick. The five platforms we see are social is you know Facebook's number one. You have Twitter, 
LinkedIn, StumbleUpon, YouTube. And then you start to get across other platforms that are starting to emerge in the space. Like Google Plus is still trying to figure it out. Tumblr, um, who I actually talked to today, they're now looking at doing ads. So they have ads active and they're testing out how to engage with big brands. And then you get into other countries like Contactia is the next one. That's a Russian Slavic version of Facebook. It looks exactly like Facebook. It's red, but it's in Russian. Uh, Weibo and Renren, which are two of the three largest ones in China. Um, I've had a client that's worked with them. They handed them $25,000 and told them, we ran your ads, thank you. That's it. So it's a very interesting world. Uh, Mixi is Japan's, was Japan's largest platform until about three months ago. And now they've started to move in the US. So there's now Mixi US with a CEO and everything. And then Pinterest, so everyone knows, is trying just to figure out how to make money. So the whole point is the top part all offer paid of some sort. Where we fit into it as the technology providers, you know, a preferred marketing developer with Facebook is try to make it easy. That's the whole purpose of where we came from. We were buying ads through the interface of Facebook and saw the need to make the whole kind of space simplified. So the quick way of looking at how to use these platforms, uh, Facebook is very interest-based, meaning people don't go there to buy computers, they go there to talk about things that they have interest by. So if you're looking to target someone who's rich, you don't target Ferrari or Rolex, you target uh, weekends in St. Bart's, fine wines, cigars, Rolexes, I mean, sorry, fine watches, stuff like that. It's a very interesting way to shift the paradigm of trying to put yourself into the conversations. And the epitome of that is kind of Twitter. Um, Twitter is all about the conversation. So like for an example, the <clears throat> debate, I think it was Mashable's tweeted about how to pick up a girl at the gym in the middle of the debate. That's not the best way to talk about Twitter, right? If everyone's talking about the debate, you kind of want to just talk about the debate. That's what's happening. But that's the problem with brands. It's very hard to understand how to work inside these platforms. Uh, LinkedIn is a very small interface, and it's, you have to find an audience. So if you're looking to target someone like Ford, or Chevy, you ha really have to make the message and the image relative to that audience. Then YouTube, I put it up there because it is becoming a very large social platform, meaning that they have brand pages now, then their product is easily transferable into every one of these other platforms. So you see followers and things like that being very similar to what Facebook has as fans. So, <clears throat> so what does Adaply do? Adaply's basically partnered with places like Facebook and Twitter and a few others of setting up technology interfaces. So we've built a platform of layer of technology you can log into and do buying and tracking and it's kind of uh, overall reporting. Um, the three things that we really focus on are these products called Circuit, Evergreen, and Momentum. Circuit basically is our optimization platform. It's taking what you could manually do through Facebook's interface and simplifying it down into five minutes. So what you could do manually of like four to five hours, our system does in five minutes, and then on top of that, it keeps iterating every 15 minutes. So basically, it's what you want out of an optimization platform. Evergreen is the new kind of shift of the paradigm where content is becoming the creative in these environments. So Facebook has this new product called Page Posts, whereas all the content on your timeline, you can now turn into an ad. Uh, Twitter, the same thing. Uh, the promoted page, sorry, the promoted tweet is now the content. Those are becoming the paid units inside of these environments. So the product Evergreen is basically a UI or a, a kind of an interface that allows you to see your content, see your organic reach, and then easily executable, execute it into a paid, con paid ad or some type of paid unit inside these platforms. So it's addressing what Facebook said six months ago. You have all this content, only 15% or 16% of your fans or your followers are seeing your content. How do you solve that? And that's definitely something that a lot of big brands are trying to figure out. If you have 25 million fans, how do you make sure that your fans see your content? And this is the thing that I think Facebook continually talks about on a weekly basis. And then momentum is kind of our analytic tool. It's really addressing the earned, owned, and paid that a lot of people talk about. Um, so earned and owned is always a big focus of how you do stuff. And paid is a kind of a accentuator of it. So having an analytic tool that allows you to jump in and see that is a good way for brands to understand if their paid is doing what they want it to do. <clears throat> just really quickly, these are the ad, I'm just gonna use Facebook in this example because it's 
kind of relative to everyone. These are the ad units that we majorly focus on. Uh, you have sponsored stories, you have promoted page posts, which is taking content in your timeline, and then we have traditional marketplace, which is an image plus a, a text. We work across three, these three ad units for Facebook to make it actually perform to whatever the client's KPIs are. So here's a perfect example. Uh, this is a momentum uh, screenshot of previous to us running a campaign and then while the campaign is running and then after the campaign. So the po focus of was to drive fans and we were very good at driving fans but overall the secondary metric was the engagement overall of the page was increased almost seven times. So not only did we drive 40,000 fans in under a month but the engagement of the overall Facebook page was huge but the beauty of it is once you turned off paid media the earned and owned continued to be almost seven times higher than before. Same type of thing. This is actually the viral. The purple is the viral and the green is the organic. So as you see, when you put paid into it, the viral increased almost 22 times because of it. And then organic also kept going up and it kept going. And this is the point. You brought the people to the site and you kept talking about it. This is just evergreen. I'm going to only have a minute, so I'll be fast. It's basically can, talking about only 16% of your audience sees your content. This is the interface. So, the, sorry, screenshots of the interface of how you see your content, how you measure it organically, and how you can execute it into a very two clicks or three clicks to promote it into your audience and then see uh, how it's actually performing. This is the case study that basically shows what we're talking about. Previous, the orange line is pre-campaign of Evergreen. The green is why we're doing it, and then the blue, of course, is after. Because the, the earned and owned and paid is all working together, so you need everything to be working correctly. And just the interesting part about it is when you're running paid with it, it was six times higher, but when you turn it off, the lasting effect was two times higher, which is always what you want to focus on, and then the last. So I think that was within time. Brands that you work with? Oh, sorry. So <laughs> I didn't put my brands up here because I work we work with large, uh, so Shiv is actually a good friend of our company, but it's very hard to get those brand names up onto these slides. So I left them off there in case he was in here, but um, he might be in here. So the guy behind the brand. Yeah, the guy behind the brand. Okay. But we have, you know, we've worked with Pepsi a long time through OMD and uh, agencies and funny enough, PR agencies are actually some of our largest vendors. Uh, we work with Edelman and Weber Shanwick a lot. So it's a very interesting scenario of media buying coming from PRs. So it's a cool world. Hey, thanks, AJ. So the next person, can you guys hear me? Uh, the next person I'm going to talk is uh, Adam from CrowdTwist. Uh, I met CrowdTwist. Um, Promobox is a tech stars company. Uh, and CrowdTwist was in the New York class ahead of us. And I just met Adam today. But when I went down to New York to meet, there's your microphone, um, to see their demo day, I saw Irv, who's the CEO of CrowdTwist, and I was like, wow. And he was so far ahead of us. Um, He's way more, more fun than I am. Is he more fun? Yeah. But I was just impressed, and uh, I always looked up to the guys at CrowdTwist, so that's why I was happy to, happy to bring him along. Cool. Give me a second here, Adam. CT. Okay. Evening. Um, I'm guessing that most of you guys, as I did, when you gave out your data in the first place, never thought it would be used everywhere for everything, and most of it being pretty irrelevant to what you actually cared about and wanted. So when CrowdTwist was developed, I think one of the things that we uh, tried to do was figure out how to look at people and the relationship they have and what they do with their data in a totally new and different way. So we talk about ourselves as a customer relationship and loyalty platform. Now, everybody out there is talking about loyalty, and everyone seems to have a new loyalty solution. I think the reality is that loyalty for us is an end state. It's a goal. It's something that we want. So we as a B2B company think of ourselves as a customer relationship platform first, with the goal being to pair the relationship that brands have and the relationship that customers have in a way that's, that's mutually beneficial and that both kind of gain, gain value out of. If you think about the old loyalty dynamic, it was very simple. Spend money, get points. Use those points at some later stage for deals and discounts, for some sort of percentage off offer. It was great when deals and discounts were the only thing that drove people and where spending was the only trackable moment in a, in a customer's life cycle. 
But the reality was, since 1995, things have evolved pretty fast. What we've seen is the rise of new channels, each of these channels capturing different types of data. And what we've also seen is this world called social loyalty. And social loyalty is actually, in some ways, a total misnomer. Social loyalty is about driving engagement on social platforms so that people can get more data. They haven't yet figured out what to do with that data because they're not able to tie it back to transactional data. And so what's happened is they look at ways of getting you to like things, getting you to take more social actions, not really understanding what the value is of those actions. So when, when CrowdTwist was developed, we thought to ourselves, how can we do three things? How can we incentivize people? How can we recognize them for what it is that they do? And how can we reward them for the value that their data drives back to the brand and therefore give them rewards that they actually love? And how can we do that across every single channel that's more reflective of how brands are actually engaging and how customers are engaging with those brands? So across digital, across all social channels, across mobile, you name it, email, physical. If there's a moment in which a, a customer's engagement can be tracked, we wanted to make sure we incentivized it, recognized it, and rewarded it. <clears throat> so we started looking at, when, when the business started, it was actually around how to connect bands and fans. And what we found is that anywhere in which there's a passionate desire to engage with some property on the other side, people happily gave up information about themselves. It was beneficial to them, it was beneficial to the bands. And as you can see, as we've grown, what we've actually started to look at is we are engaging with brands who have passionate audiences on the other side that people actually want to engage with. They enjoy those brands, those brands fit some aspect of their lifestyle very well. And so most of our brands today are, are big brands that are all looking to build better relationships with customers by giving customers more of what they want, knowing that that in turn drives their businesses. So why should brands work with startups? Three reasons that I think. I think startups, and I come from a world of big agencies and small agencies and technology companies, but startups in particular have their finger on the pulse. They know what's happening. They can move really quickly. They see things before brands see them. They see opportunities before brands see them, and they action it. They're unconstrained. So we look at, when we think about what we can do, when we sit in our management meetings and we say, we see the other brands are moving in this way, or other technology companies are building out platforms like this. What can we do about it? We can innovate on that stuff very, very quickly. We don't have the constraints of dealing with big organizations. <clears throat> and the third is our agility. So it's our speed to be able to move. In fact, I read an article this morning that someone had a dream on a Friday for what they could do with product. By Monday morning, they had built it, they had integrated it with a tech partner, and it was rolled out to customers. That agility is something that big brands have lost in a lot of ways. So working with startups brings that agility and momentum back for them. And then we have the other side. So what's the benefit to us? And I think there's three, again, three benefits. One is we get the results of working with great big brands. We get scale. Those results help us sell more to bigger brands. We also get <clears throat> innovation. So working with big brands for us is a way for us to look at what are they doing? What are they wanting? How do they want us to build our product? And therefore, how can we build a better product to innovate on our, on our own technology? And the third piece is revenue, right? It gives us money as, as startups, lets us continue this growth process. <clears throat> I can't speak about any one of our particular customers because most of our data is proprietary. So I'm going to talk about two very different, I'll give you our aggregated results. But when you look at these, two, when you look at uh, our customer base, every single one of them comes to us with a completely different requirement. So the Miami Dolphins came to us in December. They said, we want to get our fans more engaged with our, our properties across Facebook, across our website properties, in stadium. We want them to buy more food and beverage. We also want to look at our existing customer base, or season ticket holders. We want to keep them engaged with our brand more, more often. Zoomies, which is an action sports retailer, mall-based retailer, 500 stores, public company, $600 million in sales, came to us and said, we don't know our customers. We love our customers because it's all lifestyle-based, but we don't know who they are. We've never captured information on them. Help us build relationships with our customers. So in the, the loyalty, again, being the, the same end game result, but both of them looking at it from different customer standpoints. So what's this look like? So there's, uh, there's three parts to our, our platform. The user experience, which is actually very simple. 
You sign up for the uh, program, so this is the Zoom ex example, get exclusive rewards simply by doing what you already do. You go and you start earning points for everything that you do once you've signed up. So you comment on their Facebook page, you come to their website, you open their email, you click on a link in email. All of that gives you points. Those points can then be redeemed for rewards. The benefit back to the brand is, a, is, is multifold. The first is social intelligence. By 50% of people log into us using social, net, uh, social Connect, so Facebook Connect. That gives us enormous reams of data out of their personal networks. It also gives us the ability to see who else they're connected to that's connected to that brand. And we implement multiple points along their kind of customer life cycle in which they can post out to their social nets, which drive more people back into the properties. And for brands, we've actually created an automated email tool that allows them to go in and uh, create customized e emails to their audience, as well as a whole set of back-end reports and an API that allows them to pull out all of that data into their own data marts so that they can actually look at and action real-time data. What are people doing? What are they looking at? What are they interested in? How often are they interested in it? Ultimately, it drives a couple things. More engagement. Everyone keeps asking for more engagement. We've driven it for every single one of our clients. More money. We're driving not only more money, but we're driving it more frequently. So people are coming back, they're shopping, they're spending more, and they're spending more and more often. The third is we're eliminating this identity challenge. And so for years, people have come in and they've engaged in multiple points with a brand. And you look at them at six or seven or eight different consumer touch points, and they actually look like six or seven or eight different consumers. The reality is we're able to now tie back all of that brand engagement, that social influence, and that spend data back to one individual and tell you how engaged they are and how often. And the very last is more meaning. So we've actually developed two proprietary scores. One is an impact score, the other is an influence score. An impact score tells you how impactful a single consumer is at driving bottom line revenue impact for your business. And their influence score tells you exactly that, how influential they are at getting other people to come into your program and engage with your brand. So at the end of the day, I think, uh, Someone mentioned an elevator speech. We're the only customer relationship and loyalty platform that lets you incentivize, recognize, and reward people for all the ways that they impact your brand. And our tagline, as well as kind of our core philosophy, is this idea of give more, get more. And that is where we find the benefit for both the consumer and the brand. We're encouraging people to give more and get more in return for that. That's it. No Everyone's questions here, It's here for Adam. You have a question? What's that? Shiv is our friend as well, a very good friend of ours. Okay, well, I think some of, some of us need to be introduced to Shiv. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it, it's cool to hear the themes here. You know, everyone's product looks awesome when you have data in it, and all these products need brand data uh, in order to make these slides look great. So all these presentations are great, but if you're a startup, sometimes you're you know, your presentation doesn't have this data. So again, if you're a startup or you're someone wanting to work with a startup, it's key to really show what, what everyone's doing. And speaking of data, that's a segue for Raj at Localytics. Uh, if anyone doesn't know Raj, he's kind of the godfather, if you will, of the Boston mobile analytics scene, if that exists. And uh, he's, a, he's an awesome guy. He's uh, Techstars, uh, a, class, a couple classes ahead of ours. And um, he, he has a very complicated PowerPoint deck <laughs> that, um, I feel really bad now after those beautiful slides. Uh, Here, here's your mic. Um, so it, it actually started with just the logo, <laughs> um, and then Raj came in and unveiled this one. This incredible three-slide deck, including the title page and the the footer page, or whatever you call it. Yeah. Um, but I did that intentionally because I don't want to talk about our product. Um, I will cover that in 30 seconds. We provide an analytics platform for mobile applications. So we're helping the developers of iOS, Android, Blackberry, Windows, and other uh, smartphone and tablet apps understand who their users are, what people are doing in the apps, where they're running into problems. On top of that, we've built what we call the app marketing platform, which allows app developers and publishers to interact with their users um, with targeted messages and content and measure that over time. Basically, a, a marketing automation tool for app developers. So 
<clears throat> what I did want to talk about is the fact that uh, you know our market is focused on the premium end of the the segment, top 20% of uh, of publishers and developers of apps. Um, and and that's been our focus from the start. It's meant, uh, uh, you know, it's been significant, um, you know, sort of impact on how we built the company, how we relate to customers, etc. So, this is really the only slide I have. <clears throat> it's impressive. Uh, <laughs> So we're, we're about three and a half years old, uh, nearly, yeah, three and a half years old, uh, Techstars class of 2009. Um, and when we first entered the market, we didn't quite know what we were going to be doing. Um, and we, we had a mobile analytics platform. We knew there would be a need for that. As others entered the space, we sort of uh, went back to you know where are the holes and the gaps in this market and what we realized is that everybody in the space was hitting the middle and the long tail of the market so there's a lot of folks out there um, who decided you know, hey there's there's hundreds of thousands of app developers and we're gonna target them and that's a good business um, because there is a lot going on there but nobody was thinking about the needs of the the top publishers and developers in the space who have a very unique set of of needs um, they they want access to their data they want uh, services and support they want enterprise contracts. They're not willing to do a click-through agreement. And so that was the, the segment of the market that we started targeting right from the beginning. And, um, you know, I'm going to tell you, I just wanted to walk you through one customer case study, uh, which is News Corp. So News Corp is a, is a, is a very significant account for us. Uh, we're, we're being used by Wall Street Journal, New York Post, The Daily, um, many of their other international publications. Uh, so, the, where, how did we get to them? We're also we're also uh, being used by New York Times uh, across their entire organization. We approach those two very differently. So, New York Times, we had made a decision um, early 2010 that we were going to target the New York Times. They were, you know, top of the list. They were a big publisher. We were going to go after them. We started leveraging our contact networks to, to try to reach the New York Times and get to folks there. Um, a year and a half later, we finally got some traction with them, but let me come back to that. Um, what we did do is we started to try to build some reputation in our space. Um, uh, you know, we, we collected a lot of data, so we started publishing regular blog posts about what's happening in the mobile app ecosystem, Android versus iPhone, um, you know, what, what are retention rates like in, in mobile, et cetera. So we started to get a little bit of recognition. We used to go to a lot of events, but we were a bootstrap startup in 2010. We couldn't afford the $1,500 admission fees to a lot of these events. We would take the Megabus down to New York and we would crash the cocktail parties for all these events. Um, and then take the last one back late at night. Um, and, and, you know, those are, that's an awesome way to talk to some of these people in these events, first of all, bring together a lot of, um, you know, a lot of executives, a lot of people who are focused in a space, and they, they never ever check uh, badges, or at least I haven't seen them ever check badges for the cocktail hours. And that's the best place, actually, to do your networking. And so we would just do this. We, you know, we were a bootstrap startup, $30 worth of, of bus tickets, uh, maybe a cab here and there, free drinks. Um, and we'd have just as many conversations um, in those cocktail hours we could and, and sort of slowly start to get the name out there. Um, so, so early 2010, we started targeting New York Times. In May, we got this email from the Wall Street Journal saying, hey, we've heard about you guys. Um, we're looking for a mobile analytics solution. We'd like to talk. What did we do? <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> All right, but let's not screw this one up, right? Um, and so we just put a full court press on them. Um, you know, we didn't actually have to, we only had to go down there once to meet with them. And it was, it was still to date one of our quickest enterprise sales closes. We closed in 28 days. Um, it was a small contract worth probably $5,000, but it was a foot in the door. It gave us an opportunity to start doing some stuff for one of their small apps and prove ourselves. Um, 
so so now I want to just segue really quickly to what does it take? What is what have we learned that it takes to support an enterprise customer? And it's very different than the mid market. Um, the kinds of questions that these guys uh, ask. Well, first of all, right in the contract negotiation phase. Um, it's a signed contract, and every organization has different requirements, right, on indemnities. Uh, I, I had to learn everything there is about indemnities, um, which is uh, which is legal stuff that you don't want to ever have to get into if you don't have to, um, because these are the kinds of things uh, that enterprises wanted to know. They wanted uh, to feel uh, safe and secure with the people that they're using. Um, Around that same time, actually, on our website, we've never espoused that we're a startup. We're a startup. We're a small startup. But we've always um, talked bigger than, you know, and acted bigger, walked bigger than we are, put in the time and effort on your website. You know, uh, it could mean throw a picture of a building on your, uh, on your contact page, even though you're in, in dog patch labs or something <laughs> like we were, right? Um, but it's about the fact that a lot of these brands uh, and larger companies want to know that they're working with a more established player, and you can kind of, you know, fake it. Um, and, and, and that is an important part of, uh, a part of it is, is, is when you're going into a meeting, Right, um, you know, knowing what the organization is. This is News Corp. It's a very dressy place. You're going to put on a blazer when you go in and having you're having a meeting with folks at the Wall Street Journal. Whereas you go into another startup with a blazer and and, and you're not taken seriously. So you're kind of looking, acting um, the part. Once you start working with them, their questions are like tech support, right? Account management. Who's going to be taking care of me um, when I have a problem? What's your, what's your, what are your response times? What are your SLAs? And you need to be prepared with all that. We, we figured out how to. We've, um, you know, we've, we're now building out an account management team. We're building out um, a post sales consulting team. At the beginning, it was all one person um, who would basically. Um, pretend, I don't know, hope that uh, he wasn't caught on it. It was the account manager, he was, uh, he was my CTO. He was our account manager, he was our uh, pre-sales uh, rep, and then he was our post-sales rep and, and all this. But um, when they ask you about, oh, you know, uh, what does your, your account management organization look like? Well, it's like, yeah, we're gonna put somebody on this account and we're gonna, they're gonna take care of you, they're gonna nurture you. Um, and we're, we've now gotten to the point where we're we actually have these organizations, but uh, but sometimes you need to talk and act bigger than you are in order to get your foot in the door as a small startup with these guys. So that's really it. Um, I'll just end with, so when, when Wall Street Journal liked us so much, they put us in their core apps, um, they, they liked us so much also that they introduced us to a couple other divisions, New York Post and The Daily. We found a real champion at The Daily. Um, Daily is, a, is News Corp's iPad app. They're the digital experts. Um, within News Corp, we found a real champion in there who pushed us up to the corporate level. Um, Rupert Murdoch was very involved in, in The Daily because it was the digital property, and so he was seeing localytics reports on a weekly basis. Um, leveraging a lot of that, uh, we, we now signed recently a global uh, MSA with, uh, with News Corp, so we're, we're in basically every one of their properties. Um, but it was, a, it was, that was two and a half years in, in, in building that relationship. Uh, and I'll stop there. Raj, awesome story. Let's hear it for Raj. Thank you. So uh, some takeaways are act bigger and drink, I think, uh, or a couple of things I got away from that. Um, I'd also like to bring up um, Muntos, Errol from Muntos. Uh, actually, I had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to meet these guys last week when I was at Connections, uh, which is a user conference at Exact Target, which is the exact opposite of a small startup. I think it's a 10-year-old technology company. I think they're 1.5 billion market cap, 4,000 people that attended their event. Uh, I really felt about as small then as I ever did, but it was cool to hang out with some of the Muntos folks over there uh, as we commiserated. Um, I wasn't there. Yeah, unfortunately, Arrow was not there. Let me just, you, you remember what the name is? Oh, yeah, it's uh, this one. Okay. So unlike Raj, mine has a little bit more. Uh, but I'll try to keep with the theme and go, uh, go through the first part of it fairly quickly. Um, 
So Moon Toast is a, uh, what we call a social activation uh, platform. Its roots um, uh, are in music uh, as well, where uh, the company was founded out of Nashville, and musical artists want to have a, a stronger relationship with their fans. And so Moon Toast was born as a way for um, uh, artists and agencies that serve them to, uh, to deepen their relationship by being able to you know, uh, create uh, different types of conversation, but more around sort of um, uh, things that you would consider awareness, direct response, and commerce, and being able to sell their, um, their uh, records and merchandise. So, um, so we created a SaaS platform basically to allow that to happen at scale across industries. And, uh, and that's what we're doing today. And I like to just say that the uh, sort of um, evolution of platforms in social as communities organically were created um, uh, and the advent of, of uh, social networks you know, were born, the first thing was uh, a bunch of platforms that were out there to try to solve listening so that you could hear what was going on because brands were all of a sudden uh, understanding that there were messages in the public domain that they didn't have control over that weren't being broadcast. And so companies like Radiant 6 and others created a platform. The next thing was, okay, well, now that you can hear what's going on, you want to be part of the conversation. And so a whole slew of publishing and light marketing platforms came up, of which a lot of those have become uh, very well known uh, lately because they've, a lot of them have had successful exits, uh, like Buddy Media and Wildfire and Involver and uh, Vitru. And then we think that there's a third wave uh, of which we're part of, which is all about activating that. And now all that value that's been created in the network and a new value chain that's in there, how do you capture that and how do you do things that exist in sort of traditional um, digital, but now in social where it can be um, organically um, grown. And that's where Muntos comes into play. So we have a, uh, an activation engine, which is really a way for a brand to take all the offers and all of the different types of uh, uh, products and so forth that, uh, that they want to present to their fans and their consumers, but to do it in a way that's um, authentic in a, in a social, um, uh, and that could be you know, within the news feed, but around the interest and around the conversation that's going on and providing analytics to capture all that data and then uh, optimize it and, uh, and make it more relevant you know, and, and say when's the best time to you know, present a coupon or when's the best time to try to sell a product as people are, um, are, uh, are aggregating around a particular interest. I'm going to talk about Facebook. We, we also do Twitter and, and other platforms, but the dominant one and seems to be the theme here uh, is in Facebook. Um, so, you know, we have a self-service admin capability that allows you to choose from a library of, of ads and app templates that, you know, uh, for, uh, for uh, lack of a better um, uh, term, you can think of as, uh, as interactive sort of uh, ad units um, and, and apps that can be easily distributed. And, um, and then they take a variety of, uh, of form factors and, and different creative. So we have things like, you know, an email for coupon or a video that does a referral link or uh, pick your favorite coupon. But the real secret sauce of our, um, uh, each one of these units is that they're distributable in social, in the news feed, in the right-hand rail, in ad networks, and in, um, on blog sites and affiliate networks. So the, um, while the target and our solution is highly um, focused on social platforms, well, once you have solved that, it's, it's not that uh, difficult for our platform to be able to, to, um, to distribute it elsewhere. And, um, and that also includes commerce. So we can, within a particular unit, uh, take payment, uh, PCI Level 1 compliant, and take commerce. So if you think about the, the consumer journey, we can do everything from brand awareness and, and, uh, and uh, direct response, you know, gathering of information, all the way to the, uh, to the purchase transaction, which is very powerful, and we can do that all within a social platform. Um, and so, who are the, some of the brands that we've worked with, and we're, we consider ourselves still small as well. Um, but uh, uh, some of the biggest agencies, Leo Burnett, Gray, um, uh, uh, and, um, and some of the biggest uh, publishers like Time and Simon Schuster, and then uh, brands like Nike and P&G across all of their brands and, uh, and others. And then um, um, partnerships with Facebook and we're a PMD, 
um, along with uh, you know PayPal and Demandware and and uh, and several others that will be uh, rolling out and Exact Target as well. Um, so um, I have very similar stories to uh, to Raj as well. Cocktail parties. Uh, we go to some of these different conferences, and the same thing. We'll host the party uh, sometimes, which is a better bang for the buck because you get the same types of conversations and the same types of ability to network, uh, more so sometimes than you do speaking and uh, and trying to make those rounds. And the um, and you try to you know try to do a good mix of that, and uh, and then all of a sudden you become familiar to, to people that think you're much bigger than you are, and you play much bigger than you are, and uh, and that's a you know sort of a trick of the trade of being a, being a startup that uh, has a loud voice. And, uh, and that loud voice uh, caught the attention of, uh, of Nike. And uh, the case study that uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about is uh, during the Olympics. Um, uh, uh, people here, Nike Plus members, or utilize that at all? OK, a couple. So I'll, sp I'll give you one, one second on Nike Plus. So Nike Plus is a, um, it's a uh, sort of a, uh, uh, a way for Nike to uh, build uh, cap uh, action among their um, customers that allow them to sync up um, to a, uh, a thing that, that creates uh, fuel points, um, a central database. And it's all about being active. And every time you jog, you sync up. It gives you all these different ways to um, challenge other people, uh, achieve your goals. And, uh, and Nike has these big campaigns around, um, and in fact, in this one, trying to make one day, it happened to be August the 12th, which was uh, uh, coincided with the Olympics, the biggest day in the history of Nike uh, Plus for getting everyone to activate on that particular day, to sync up and say what they, what, what they were doing, jogging, uh, exercising, going for a walk, whatever but having everybody do it on that particular day. So we were part of that. Um, they did all sorts of things. I'm sure many of you saw the Find Your Greatness uh, during the Olympics, TV, print, and we were part of their um, Facebook solution. These were uh, some of the different um, uh, forms and apps that we did uh, that played video and sent links to get them all to join a, a Facebook event um, and, um, and also share it in Twitter and, and elsewhere. And the way... Um, it works is uh, in the newsfeed and in the right here in rail. So as you're in your newsfeed, it looks uh, a little bit like a, uh, a YouTube video. But when you click on it, it actually turns into one of our, our apps. And, uh, and it also works in the right hand rail as well. Um, uh, uh, the Adaptly, uh, um, you know, it's something that um, uh, basically can be marketplace or premium uh, in that context. And, um, and it's part of the beauty of how we were able to get some and land some of these bigger clients is that we help you know, make Facebook, which is a, you know, a big platform, uh, money. And, um, and then we have you know, data that we, we got out of this case study that starts to tell you interesting things that we can start to you know, share or aggregate. And, uh, and subsequently, that makes our you know, voice a little bit louder amongst other brands. And we can share information like 20 to 30 percent of the traffic that we see comes from mobile. Uh, we can share different in-app experiences and say how people are, are interacting with that. And all of those types of things then help us work with other big brands. And uh, I refreshed uh, over the weekend. I don't know how many people have read uh, you know, Clayton Christensen's work, um, who's a, um, uh, uh, a major thought leader in innovation out of uh, Harvard Business School and wrote the book Innovator's Dilemma, Innovator's DNA, Innovator's Solution, all of these different uh, factors. But, you know, the big, I tried to pull out what I remember uh, to be in uh, the, the major points. And it's not that big brands aren't aware of an innovation or, or that they couldn't apply resources to it. It's just that they're encumbered by their current P&L and the way that they operate. And so it's, it's difficult for them to apply resources outside of their sustaining innovations that help them compete and try to either leapfrog or stay competitive with their with their uh, current products and so they're they're you know it's difficult for them to be able to all of a sudden where some place has lack of profitability for them to, to jump into it and that's where startups play startups live off the balance sheet for a while some of them get you know profitable quicker than others 
But that ability to do that is the opportunity and why, you know, like they sort of took the innovator solution and said that why big brands typically I've, I've found, and um, this is my, what, fifth or sixth startup, that at some point or another when you crack a particular code and you get your first, um, uh, you know, big brand or your first big partnership that allows you to get some credibility, uh, you find it much easier to work uh, and, they f and you find uh, a lot easier than you would expect um, once you get over that first hump because you're able to do things that they would like to be able to do and, uh, and they have a lot of leverage with you as well. So, um, so those are my, uh, my, I don't know, my, my, my capture of, uh, of what I think small startups and big brands uh, make, uh, make good music together. <laughs> Great, thanks Errol, thanks. appreciate it. Let's give it up for Errol. So it was, it was cool to see Errol touch on something. We talk big brands and we think big brands need to be manufacturing brands or CPGs, but I think you also touched upon agencies. I mean, there's a lot of agencies flowing around here. Agencies are critical. Agencies got us some of our first business. And you also had some partnerships on there like Demandware, uh, which I think are just as challenging to get uh, as a big brand. So that's definitely part of the ecosystem. So thanks for sharing that. Um, and I'm gonna introduce um, a company I'm not totally sure on. Uh, actually, my, my most favorite company, uh, Promobox, and my co-founder, Sunsire Sun Hanel. It's Sunsire is her first name. Um, and she makes me look good every day with w what she does with the brand. So I'll let her, let her jump in. This is your. Thank you. Excited to be here today. How's everyone doing? Good, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, I'm Sunsire Hanel, and I'm co-founder and VP of client marketing at Promobox. And I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about our experience that we've had working with some pretty, uh, pretty big brands and some of the things that we've learned along the way. Promobox is actually all about pairing the big guys with the little guys. It's what we do as a brand to retailer marketing platform. We help large manufacturing brands like Chevrolet, Reebok, Volkswagen, and Trek Bikes to launch online campaigns with online marketing campaigns with their local retailers in order to strengthen the relationships between the two and to also localize the brand's national marketing. Um, as a fairly young startup, we're certainly extremely lucky to be working with such uh, iconic brands. And it all started with Chevrolet. As a two-ish year old startup, we weren't the only ones that I have to admit were surprised and of course ecstatic by our partnership with Chevy. And when they announced that Promobox would be powering each dealer version of Chevrolet's 2012 Super Bowl 46 campaign, uh, there was a ton of interest that was generated by that. Everyone, a uh, lot of the media outlets were wondering what exactly happens when a large company like Chevrolet partners with a tiny startup to power Super Bowl. Um, so it was interesting to see uh, that, that uh, coverage and of course that was great, but what we've learned from that experience and what we continue to learn from that um, is far greater. It gets to the heart at a trend that we're seeing. Um, big brands becoming more and more interested in partnering with small startups, and of course, small startups jumping at the chance to partner with large brands. And in my experience, I feel like it really comes down to three key benefits for each. And I'll get into that, but first I just wanna set aside the mentality that many of us have that big brands are a big payday and that startups are tiny, shiny objects that are fun to play with. Um, because definitely that might be reasons why you enter into conversations with one another, but it's not the type of benefit that's gonna sustain you in a successful long-term relationship. Of course, well, relationship, I should say a uh, partnership. <laughs> um, Same so, thing. yeah. Um, so the three key factors or benefits of each startups, um, you, you should know that brands are interested in working with you because you're innovative. You most likely are the only one that's trying to do what you're trying to do or hopefully you're the best at it and brands are definitely drawn to that. You're extremely responsive, we are, because we're small, um, someone mentioned we're small nimble teams and we're able to quickly react and respond to things that arise that we need to quickly react to and we're passionate. We will do anything we need to do 
to make sure that our product is amazing, that our team is amazing, and that our partners absolutely love what we do and we, we provide a ton of value. Um, if one of these things, any startups in the room, if one of these things does not describe you, I would definitely use that for cause to press in and, and just think about that because it's definitely one of the key reasons why a big brand is gonna wanna work with you. Uh, brands, you should know that us startups are very interested in partnering with you because you're inspiring. Um, you have a long track record of success. You're extremely challenging, of course, as a large organization, lots of ins and outs to consider, lots of ways to, to get things happening. And you're extremely, brands, extremely results oriented. So you're gonna push our team, you're gonna push our product, and we're gonna be better because of you. Uh, so brands and startups together, we create magic. We do things together we absolutely could not do apart, um, and that's part of the fun of it. So I'm just going to share a few of the success stories that Promobox has had working with our brand clients and some of the magic or music that we've created together. Um, so I mentioned Chevrolet's uh, 2012 Super Bowl 46 campaign uh, that launched earlier this year. I know it's a little anticlimactic to actually show all of these dealer participation rates on my slide, but I will say um, GM's uh, global CMO at the time said to us, if you could get 5% dealer participation rate in your um, uh, for the Super Bowl campaign, That'll be great. That'll be amazing, actually. And we thought, we're going to knock his socks off. We're going we're gonna to amaze him. We're going to double it. We'll maybe even get it to 15%. Um, and we actually saw 46% dealer participation rate, which was completely unheard of in the industry, period. And it became Chevrolet's most successful dealer initiative to date. It's actually what drove them um, to sign a contract with us for the next 10 months. And they actually just re-upped yesterday for 15 months, which is fantastic. Yay. Um, and, you know, it's because Chevrolet, the, when they talk about Promobox, they talk about how we're an innovative platform, how we're helping them do something that they've never been able to do before, and how their dealers are loving us. So that's where innovation comes in, and um, we're absolutely loving it. Uh, for Trek's Tour de France campaign, they launched a few months after Chevy, and again, they were hoping for 15, maybe 20% dealer participation rate, um, and they saw 55%. Um, that was amazing. I think a part of that really um, was because the dealers of Trek had a lot of questions before they were going to launch or opt into Trek's campaign, and the Promobox support team had to be extremely responsive um, to those questions if those dealers were going to actually opt in and participate participate, and we were, and that's what helped drive those participation rates. And then Reebok Classics, they launched their It Takes a Lot campaign. They saw an unreal 95% uh, dealer participation rate, so we just see it keeps getting better, um, and we're absolutely loving it. They, um, they launched this campaign with a subset of their urban uh, and trend retailers, independent retailers across the United States. And again, we're just amazed by this uh, participation. And because of our passion, we're not stopping there. We recently launched Volkswagen's Why VW Stories campaign two weeks ago, and we're already seeing 25% of dealers participating just in two weeks, and that number is increasing daily. What's interesting about Volkswagen dealers is they love Volkswagen. Um, it may be surprising to hear that not all retailers actually love the brands they sell. A lot of them feel like brands don't understand them at all. Um, but Volkswagen gets it. They get their dealers and their dealers love them for it. And they not only are opting into this campaign, but they're sharing it at, at an astounding rate. 96% um, of them are sharing this campaign on Facebook, their own version of it. And they're also adding it as a tab to their Facebook page so it lives there indefinitely, um, which is awesome. So. I hope that some of these stories were inspiring to you. I know listening to everyone else, it was definitely inspiring, and it just keeps us moving forward. Um, it's really unheard of that we are able to, we feel that we're able to work with such amazing brands um, on a daily basis in the long term, and uh, that's pretty cool. So uh, I'm, I'm available after the session if you want to chat any more inspiring stories. Thanks. Thanks, Sincere. Thank you, good job. Yeah, it's kind of cool to hear that story because if you had told me that story a year ago when we just had Barney Butter, I would say it was a bad story because I wouldn't believe it. 
Uh, so we're pretty excited to be where we are today. Uh, but we definitely have a long way to go. So um, I definitely owe it all to the team, like, like team members like Sincere and a bunch of other people in the room. So good stuff. Uh, I'm going to bring another great company up, uh, Jonathan RevTrax. Why don't you come up? Uh, Jonathan, back when we were just a, you know, a P little concept, um, was an, an intro I got from an investor that actually invested in Jonathan's company and eventually in our company. Um, so it was awesome to uh, it was awesome to get a chance to see somebody that was doing amazing things with amazing brands and uh, had a great opportunity today to catch up. And uh, you know, it's really good and glad you came representing the big NYC. So I'll get your presentation up. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks for everybody for, for now falling asleep. Um, I think, I think one, one of the, the best parts about this was I, uh, I hadn't seen anybody's presentation. And by going towards the end, um, actually helped me frame up what I want to communicate. Um, and just, I, I really appreciate the candidness from a lot of the entrepreneurs in the room because, you know, it, you don't normally have that level of candidness when you're working with big brands. So uh, hopefully there aren't any big brands in the room. But uh, no, hopefully there are. Uh, so, so what I want to share with you guys is a little bit about RevTrax um, and really share kind of how we started and how people thought we were crazy because of what, you know, the mission was that we set out to accomplish. Um, more or less the story that we tell is that digital by 2016 is going to influence half of all retail. And five years ago when we started the company, four and a half years ago, we had large retailers who were not convinced that digital could impact in-store sales. So we believed otherwise. We came from a world of e-commerce, marketing analytics, and we said the future of marketing, specifically direct marketing, promotional marketing, is going to be digital. The future of retail sales is still in-store. We know that there's an opportunity here to help provide uh, tracking and attribution technology for um, large retailers and CPGs for their promotional marketing efforts across all channels. Oop, we're going fast here. So the fact that digital influences store sales is a remarkable revelation that people pretend like they always believed. They didn't always believe it. Now they believe it more and more. We're excited. <clears throat> Where we juxtapose now versus then is not now versus then. It's now versus now. For a lot of big brands, one of the benefits, but perhaps one of the frustrating things is brands live in the past. Bigger the brand, the slower they move and evolve, the more they live in the past. Many of these old school brands are actually our clients. So they're kind of stuck in the middle of both these worlds, of the old world of couponing. It's a C word. We usually don't like to use it, but, but people get it. This idea of pushing coupons out there to the masses through newspaper. Um, I won't even do a high-low, but would it be surprising to you guys to know that 85% of all CPG coupons in the country today, actually uh, on Sunday, are going to be distributed through newspaper? 85%. Um, people love mobile. People talking about mobile, it's fractional percentages in terms of what it's actually doing to drive revenue for these brands. The future, of course, is digital. Well, what does that mean? It's omni-channel. Best part about it is it's a term that didn't exist when we started our business. And now it actually describes exactly who we are, omni-channel promotional management. We built a platform that helps our clients and enables them to drive conversion through promotions through any digital channel into their store in a way that's secure, in a way that's highly attributable and measurable. So we're a B2B technology cell. And what's even crazier is we're an enterprise software cell. So getting back to who thought we were crazy, every single VC we talked to, four and a half years ago thought we were nuts and wouldn't invest in the company. Um, some of our partners who are now great partners at the time thought, who is this company that thinks that they're an enterprise software cell? Like, you're not Oracle. We, uh, in a way, kind of had you know, delusions of grandeur. And I think that most entrepreneurs who are going to work with big brands and want to work with big brands have got to sort of fake it until they make it a little bit. And one of the things we did really well is telling a value proposition that really solved a big pain point for our clients. So we never did the startup thing. Never. Even to date, you know, there's a Silicon Alley in New York City. I don't even know where it is. Okay, we're at 30th and 5th. Anybody want to come visit, feel free. I think it's south of us, but we've always been focused on how are we going to sell a brand who's going to put us through procurement 
aka the ringer, beat us up on price, drag us through the mud for 18 months to decide that they want to close a deal. And oh, by the way, whoever said that there was a deal for five grand on the table, that's what it costs us to negotiate an MSA in terms of internal resource costs, because we get to a fun big stage or growth stage where actually we need to allocate internal costs to G general counsel and whatnot. Um, we can spend between 2,500 and 10 grand to negotiate an MSA with Sears, Walgreens, Hallmark, Sports Authority, Kimberly Clark, any other major retailers and CPGs that we work with. So we didn't know this. We were like young, stupid, and naive. And we said, hey, how can we work with big brands? That nobody's doing what we're doing. Nobody's crazy enough to do what we're doing. People are telling us we're nuts. Well, it must mean we're onto something. So what I'll share with you guys is a few basic visuals. I, I could share metrics. I think it's very unimportant, especially given the context that, that others have, have uh, have articulated that this is really about sort of evangelizing small company working with big brands. Yeah, we, we, we work with big brands, okay? Kimberly Clark is one of our largest CPG clients. They make things like Huggies and Scott's and Continental and Depends for anybody over 40 in the room. <clears throat> the, the reality is we've executed digital promotional campaigns, particularly around coupons with Kimberly Clark as our client, both direct to consumer through email, social, search, display, as well as with some of their key retail partners. Retail customers like a Target, you'll see Walmart on the following page, and digital marketing companies that have become partners of ours. Of course, we're not a media company. We don't do anything slick on Facebook, but we have a lot of partners who do. So one of the things that we've learned over time is one of the key ways that to go from nothing to something with a big brand is you've got to borrow credibility from somewhere. One of the places we barred credibility were from partners, right? Partners in the email arena, the exact targets, who's a partner of ours, the cheetah mails, the silver pops, in search, working and having friends and, and advocates inside Google and Yahoo and the, the search management platforms. And, you know, you can begin to go down the row as far as all the digital media channels. We realized there was real value in aligning ourselves, even if it was just with a handshake or the permission informally to throw a logo on our sales deck to bar the credibility of our partners, because we didn't compete with anybody. We connect digital promotion through any marketing channel to an offline sale <clears throat> and provide that feedback loop so that marketers can measure ROI in their direct response digital marketing. And with Target and with a Kimberly Clark, the benefit, of course, is that we can enable very cool executions with a pretty flexible technology that allows the brand to do marketing, whether it's zip code targeting through display, this is, was through email and some social sharing that we partnered with a, a company or other vendor of, C, of Kimberly Clark called Social Twist. So these are all cool executions. Bottom line is all the digital URL parameters and all the tracking variables that a client wants to measure, like who shared with who, or was this from a particular email address that I targeted, or display creative, all that stuff we basically cram together and inject in that barcode. And we track it through the offline conversion. <clears throat> so what we've engineered, which people again thought we were crazy, is a way to connect online to offline without a POS integration. Because that never would have happened. <clears throat> and our ability to basically thrive as a, a, a middleware provider, saying, look, we are going to develop an expertise. Our CTO had it. The rest of the team had to learn it. Talk the talk on POS. What are different POS systems, back-end, CRM systems, data warehouse systems? How are we going to get data files, data feeds on redemptions, associated SKUs, basket spend, and how are we going to associate it with this whole thing called digital marketing? And actually present it to all of our clients' enterprise-level vendors that make it relevant to their particular vertical, like an exact target in email or somebody in social or somebody in display. So we had to, in many ways, to get where we are today, partner aggressively because RevTrax is a plug-in to all digital marketing verticals. And I think that was really a, a key ingredient to our success. Another example, Huggies on Walmart being able to track a lot of what Huggies was looking to do here, engaging consumers with video content through walmart.com, being able to reward them with a coupon, and for RevTrucks to be able to track it all through, um, through click to redemption. I'd add that one of the key things that we're trying to do as a company is establish and evangelize metrics in the online to offline world. 
right? Everybody loves metrics in this room and digital people love metrics, but offline people don't really understand that. And we're sitting in this weird place where we'll sit across the table from the director of direct mail at a retail client. And we're trying to explain to them why what I just showed you guys is gonna return 2X on what he spends today, which is you know, 10 million a quarter on direct mail. He doesn't get that. It takes months, if not years, to evangelize and educate. So a lot of what we had to learn working with big brands is patience. Right? There's a huge amount of education, whether it's in the social channel, brands rely on agencies. Our sell those not to agencies. So we've had to learn and be patient educating our brand clients or our retail clients who work with agencies, and we have a great relationship with those agencies, but helping clients understand this world of omni-channel, online to offline, and helping them understand metrics on conversion of click to a download of an offer to a redemption of an offer so that they can start to apply those metrics across all their digital channels. I think that's a pretty tough, tough haul. Um, and I, I think a lot of you would appreciate that. But you know, so far, so good. Over, working with over 200 major CPG brands, 100 major retailers, and you know, things just keep getting better. So it's getting that snowball rolling and then continuing to try to build momentum, going from crashing cocktail hours to actually hosting cocktail hours, and, um, and, and going from attending a sponsorship and getting a free pass to exact target three years ago because I couldn't afford the, the, the admission ticket to you know, following your sponsoring and this year sponsoring. And you know, it's kind of the, the credibility you can build with partners and start somewhere and grow. It's, it's what's exciting about working with big brands, um, especially if you can, you can make an impact and solve a real need. So, covered a lot, but hopefully it was somewhat insightful for you guys. I appreciate the time. Cool, thanks Jonathan. Let's hear it for Jonathan. I got it. So a couple cool themes there. One I think was, um, um, what was it, borrow, borrow the, um, borrow credibility. I thought that was really interesting. I think everyone in this room at some point had to borrow credibility. Um, and, but the other thing I think is interesting is education. I think that as all these startups have said, they've all been educating their brands to new things, new innovative things. Um, so you're not really selling, you're educating. And it sounds like really I thought that came across nicely in your presentation, Jonathan. Um, so, so we got one more presentation left, then we're gonna do a panel, and then we're gonna go drink a bit. So I brought my closer in all the way from Toronto, Canada, Winston Mock. Why don't you come up, Winston? Uh, I met Winston uh, at, at Techstars. Uh, he's a Techstars class after us. I was just blown away by his passion, uh, his kung fu skills and rap oh, skills. God, yeah, right? the break dancing. Down? Yeah. Thank right. you, Ben. I will, I'll, I'll pull up your presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, I am the closer. I came in all the way from Cole, Toronto, which actually, you're yeah, right, it's just, uh, just uh, west of Boston by a little bit, so it's not too far to get to. But I'm going to be following a note, I think, very closely with uh, Jonathan from RevTrack on kind of our company and how we started uh, as a tiny startup and started working with large retailers. Um, what I'm going to cover actually dates back to just early in the year, uh, one of the, how we kind of started in this space. Um, and let me see if I get my first slide here. And it really was around the same concept of couponing. I, too, feel the word couponing. It's a little tarnished because of the TV show Extreme Couponing. I don't know if you've seen that, but oh god. It's almost like Honey Boo Boo, but in a different way. Um, we were a very small company and pegged with the same challenge. We, had, we were actually a mobile app shop, and we built mobile apps for retailers. And we said, oh, after we build these apps, how else are we going to make money? So we said, why don't we try to solve a problem for you? Um, and it really revolved around digital coupons. So our proposition, we pitched to, uh, we're a Canadian uh, shop, so we pitched to one of Canada's largest retailers and said, why don't you give us a chance here to prove out on one of your smaller retail branches uh, how digital couponing really could change your business. And our proposition was leveraging the coupons to develop simple, actionable analytics, right? Um, so the case study I'm gonna cover in my presentation, really it was working with a national retail partner it's specific in their petroleum retail shops. So there's about three of the, 300 of these locations. And our goal uh, really is they've got, a, they've got a diverse product mix, both in-store, uh, in-house brand, and CBG. So it just kind of paints a picture of, uh, of the retail shop that we worked with. So just some basics on the digital couponing. It was key for us to educate them. Like that was a big part. Um, how could they, you know, 
how could they leverage what was traditionally always paper couponing uh, in the digital space? So in the same line, in Omnichannel, digital's got a lot more reach. It's not just one of those things you mail. So we helped them set up all the integration with you know, their e-marketers, the, the Facebook side of things, their mobile app, their website, so you could get a broad delivery. And then, of course, uh, the target customer would receive it, be specific to them and very targeted so that this is a customer base that was already existent to them. A big part is sharing. In the paper world, you know, the sharing wasn't there. And you really had to educate them because the bigger they are, the slower that they are in understanding it. They didn't really even have a, a staffing or, or any formal kind of uh, policy around Facebook and how you should use it. And we leveraged it to promote. So the sharing piece was big. And of course, redemption. Um, as we all know, point of sale redemption is, it, it, these are archaic systems. Often enough, they're 15, 20 years old and you're trying to plug into something that's really old. So we, we had to work incessantly to, to create a simple solution that would actually break this and make it work for them. And the last piece, of course, was the analytics side of things. So digital couponing required us to kind of work very hard at building out each of these parts so the retailer could literally take what was I don't, God knows how old paper coupons are, but really move it into the, the 21st century. So small companies, the real benefit was, this is what caught them. This was the image that just caught them and sold them and they saying, you know, we want to do more of this. And this is actually a visualization of what happens when you send a digital coupon out in your customer group. Every dot is a person and every line is a relationship. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. So there's the relationship between an influencer and an advocate, or an advocate becoming an influencer. And you can see this person's really important. They sent out like 400. God knows how many. Half of these, I think, redeemed. Um, and these are kind of segments in the relationship between advocates. So this is something that they had never seen before. And I think s s we're innovative. Like small companies really have that advantage to be able to pull out kind of, you know, what's the most impactful thing we're going to do that a big company is going to recognize? We took that and of course, you know, we put some basic segmentation and our early results allowed us to kind of break down the audience um, that we were sending them to into adopters, people who for the first time came, loyalists, anyone who came more than once, an advocate, somebody who shared, and of course the influencer, the one who's really done a job and convinced somebody else to go in. And you know, some early results for us showed that new customers uh, reached through this sharing, they're just far more likely and it all makes sense. But you need that proof in your pudding to prove that you know this little, this this smaller company has a proposition that's that's valuable and it's got insight into the future and we should really push along with it. From the advocacy side, um, you know we really had uh, new customers coming in because outreach would show that people are going to share it to people that don't know about this brand or this retailer and they're going to come in and they're going to discover it themselves. Um, to kind of summarize in some of the results, a big thing for us was we were able to increase their audience. They had run their email list for, I don't know, maybe 10 years before this, and this is the first time they saw a significant lift over the first three months. Uh, redemption uh, went up. Just going to digital, you get this sharing effect. It's a lot easier and convenient to share, so that also increased the redemption rates. We did two interesting things with the data, too, for them, and this is kind of over and beyond. It's a little bit agency style, but we consulted them and said, you know, if we target your advocates, can we get them to increase their advocacy? So we did some basic exercises where we target them with specific messaging, and then we saw this lift or increase in the number of advocates um, in the population. And we did the same by targeting loyalists with this kind of mediocre offer to see, do people just come in to buy because they like, they like the brand? And the funny thing is sometimes people will just come in even though it's not that great a deal. It's just because they're loyal to you and you're telling them, hey, you're special, you know? So you line those two things up, you get some decent results. And these are kind of things that we felt we had to really push through and go and beyond to prove to really, I, th I find the retailers, they're always under the pressure um, in terms of trying to make that, that top line grow and, and watching their bottom line. So for startups kind of pitching the brands in retail, it's an, old, it's an old system, an old churn. So you really have to show results and technology definitely isn't their forte. So the challenge for us really was kind of simplification. Like our goal was to come in as a very simple player. That's what appealed to them as a startup. So the, co the classic problem that we were trying to solve is you're a big retailer. We did the mobile work for you and you had way too much data, way too much. You never could solve any problems with all this data because we always asked them, what are you doing with it? And they said, well, I'm just kind of collecting it. 
our thing really was on the left. You know, it's like, hey, we're small, we're simple. And these have to be actionable analytics. So we're going to try to really solve a problem for you. And hopefully, you'll pay us. So where, where are we going with this? Well, you know, a lot of the solutions to date have been around kind of this blast, spray, and pray with messaging. Um, and, and that's the reality of the old world, right? They used to print it once or print it a thousand times and ship it to all the houses. Now, of course, we've been adapting a lot more and moving toward intent-based solutions. So things that allow customers to interact with you. I think in some of the earlier slides, you saw it's all about that engagement level, that social engagement, the, the, the actual posting in forums. That, that type of stuff results in kind of the next generation. And our company, of course, is focused on that. So we've had to progress. The message, I, this was, the data they showed there was our first client. It was a, it was a smaller retailer in, in Canada. That was just early in the year. And already by now, we're in about nine months later, we already got to pitch a brand new vision with them because they want to see that progression. And the reality, I think, is as small companies grow towards big brands, uh, they really have to continue to evolve that pace, keep ahead of the mark, and at the end of the day, make something that the big brands value. And, and staying nimble is one of the big things that, that remains competitive, I think, for all small companies. OK, so that's, uh, that's it for me. So thank you for listening. And I hopefully those results were beneficial for you. Thanks. Thanks, Winston. Um, I'm actually going to call up each of the, each of the presenters to come, um, come up front just for a quick panel. And uh, you guys can, can ask some questions from the audience, because I know you probably are dying to ask. Winston, where he got his jacket. <laughs> I actually am Winston. So I'm going to fire off the first question. Uh, if we got everyone here, Raj, we need you. Um, and I'm going to go right for a hard one. Um, so we talk about, you know, you guys are able to get brands. Um, do you have any stories of losing brands? And you can move the microphone, since we don't want you to cover this one. <laughs> But Jonathan jumped right up. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud to, uh, to, to share the, the losses as well as the wins. <laughs> and I think that companies, uh, startups, get to a point where they have enough clients where the, the rule of averages actually take form. Uh, and what that means is you know, a good company that can retain or renew 85% of their revenue and their clients is doing a pretty good job. Um, I'd like to say we're better than that, but there was a major QSR uh, quick serve restaurant chain that we worked with for a full year, uh, 2011. I really won't name the name because uh, of sensitivities around that. But the bottom line is we worked with them for a full year. And uh, they were cheap. <clears throat> we cut the price to win the deal and, you know, expected to be able to grow that piece of business going forward. And, you know, upon renewal, we, uh, we basically brought the price back to where we felt uh, comfortable the market was, uh, which was three to four times what they had paid us the previous year. And you know, we knew it was a gutsy move, but um, you know, we also knew it was the right move for us because they were a very resource intensive client. Um, we all love really cheap resource intensive clients, right? <laughs> so, uh, so we were like, okay, we've had enough. Let's price them where they need to be. And you know, they walked. Um, and they actually determined that they could probably hack together an internal solution that hasn't really worked too well. So yeah, we lost them, and that was a uh, a six-figure client that uh, that we ended up losing after a year working with them. Anyone else feel that, feel feel like this share? AJ, oh, I got a lovely one. <laughs> um, large bank uh, came to us, and we had a, a seven-digit deal that was for a whole year. Um, started to get complicated because there was two agencies, a PR company, uh, the client direct, and then Facebook, Twitter, and. Uh, another vendor, <clears throat> all involved in the actual media buying aspect. So there was l roughly seven partners that were all giving their two cents. Twitter was saying, work with us directly. Facebook was saying, buy more premium. And then the agency was trying to dictate how it all went. So after about three or four months, they kind of, oh, again, the person that was making decisions on the client side was a year out of college. So it was a very uh, hard thing to convince them of what they should be listening to. Um, so after about three months, it went horribly wrong. And the funny thing is, is the performance of the campaign was astronomical. Like we drove, I think, over 300% lift in engagement and, you know, 60,000 uh, Twitter followers in less than a month. So all the numbers equaled like great performance, but there was such rhetoric amongst everyone involved that it was like a witch hunt. 
and it automatically, like, summer came around, the whole thing blew up. So, and the sad thing is the client actually shut down for six months. They actually didn't do anything inside their environment. Um, and it was a global brand, but we now are just starting to see a shift back into it. But it's pretty sad. Seven, seven different companies got involved and actually destroyed the client mm. instead of actually helping them um, over it. And the sad thing is on the, each company involved, multiple people were fired from different locations. So it was... Wow. A very intensive um, situation. So, so big brands can have big problems. What's, what's, what did Biggie say? More, more money, more problems? <laughs> Sage man. Uh, anyone else care to share a story, lost customer? Yeah, not... Like crowd twist, come on. Uh, the Say good thing is so. we actually haven't lost a customer yet. You um, fired one. We are... We're, we're in the midst of... You know, I think you had a, a slide that had the payday slide. And I think that uh, startups often want all the big brands to fall in line with them. The reality is big clients can actually be the death of your business if you're not careful in how you structure your contracts. So to your point, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, money, and effort investing in going after these new clients, working with them to figure out a deal that works, typically works better for them than it does for us because they know that we're in that position. And we have, a, we have a client that is, you know, we've driven results across the board. You, you couldn't look at the metrics and argue that we haven't, you know, benefited their business tremendously. But their organization does not work well with third parties. Their industry does not work well with, you know, anyone outside of their industry. And the reality is they'll short themselves on opportunity by not doing what they should, which is figuring out better ways to leverage us as opposed to, you know, yeah. get rid of us. So... That's a great story. We always joke at Promo Box. I don't know, anyone watch Mad Men? Uh, Mad Men, if you know Mad Men, they had a client, Lucky Strike, which I think was the majority of their business. And we're always like, we, we can't have Lucky Strike customers. We have to have customers that we can get rid of, even if they're as big as some of the customers we work with. So that's kind of a good story that sometimes, even though it feels big, the payday slide, you know. I think you know startups need to figure out where their threshold is, right. and 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 make sure that they do not go below that threshold. If you know that cutting your price by another twenty percent is going to actually be to your detriment, just don't do it. Right, it's fair. Anyone else feel like sharing a story? Um, I could turn it over to questions. Anyone in the audience have questions they'd like to ask? This is a pretty amazing panel right here. Just because she's closer, I'll get to you next. Hi, everyone. My question is for Raj in particular. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for being so candid. Um, I really enjoyed your story. And my question is, when you first um, started accumulating these big brand names as clients, um, and it was just you and your partner, I'm assuming, there were just a few of you, how did you feel or how did you compensate for not having enough staff and then having the work, you know, were you like, holy cow, what am I going to do now? Yeah, no, uh, good question. So for us, it was, uh, we had three co-founders originally, two on the tech side and myself, and then our fourth co-founder joined, um, you know, probably early days of the company. And, and between, and he was on the business side of it. Both myself and him um, had, you know, uh, over a decade of, of enterprise sales service um, type of experience. I ran a pre-sales engineering team um, for a like an enterprise software company. Uh, he had run business development uh, in the mobile advertising space, working with enterprises. So we we kind of knew how to work with large companies, um, and and I think. Uh, between two, I think if it was just me, I would have died. Um, but between two of us, we were able to create enough balance, enough, uh, um, you know, sort of back and forth. And two of us going to the events, we doubled the, the amount of territory uh, that we and number of conversations we're, ha we're able to have. So, so I think in the early days of the company, um, uh, one person would have been super difficult. But if you've got two people who both have at least some level of experience doing this, you can get around it. We we had good legal support. Fortunately, our legal firm, our law firm, was giving us a lot of free work in the early days, so that uh, you know that that five thousand dollar deal today would not be <laughs> we couldn't do it because it probably cost us uh, you know at least ten grand to do do a contract like that. Um, so so yeah, for us it was about um, leveraging that experience we had. Um, and trying to sort of streamline the process as much as possible. So what was important for us was to do everything over the phone. 
um, do as, as, as few sort of visits as possible, make sure that we're really qualifying things before we go down and make a visit, which takes, you know, a day of time and, and, and other costs. Um, with our legal agreements, trying to streamline them as much as possible so that every single one is in custom. Once we've built one that we can sort of, you know, just, just iterate on the next customer, it's already resolved a lot of the issues we're going to expect to come up. Uh, Two-part question. Um, you've all had some pretty amazing results. Thanks for sharing. Um, have you had to turn down an acquisition offer in your early days that, you know, you're doing a great job for somebody and they say, geez, we'd like to buy you? And then the uh, second part of that question is when you're small and you're dealing with um, two clients that uh, might be competing against each other, how do you compartmentalize that? Um both have the same answer, turning down an acquisition offer, your first, and uh, trying to deal with two major brands who don't want you to work with the other one is, uh, is ballsy. So it, what the uh, you know, first experience that we had, I think we were in business for a year and a half, and we had the interest of a, uh, a multinational media conglomerate who wanted to work with us in Japan. And uh, we had never done anything outside of uh, the U.S. At that, at that point. And we're like, yeah, the technology works, right? There are tubes and pipes, and it's the Internet. So, you know, we should be good. And they, uh, they made an acquisition offer for like two million bucks when, you know, we had like 90 grand in sales. And, uh, you know, we were so excited about the, the flattering offer. But, you know, we, we knew it was premature or felt it was. So we more or less played the card that we wanted to prove out the partnership value first before we, we, we thought that a strategic uh, sale or even investment made sense. So I think that we've, we've played that card a handful of times, more or less biding our time to say, look, we, you know, very flattered, but I think that we want to prove out the value in the partnership first to make sure that there's good alignment, that there's success in, you know, what we're going to do together for a mutual client so, uh, so that we, we can justify the, the decision to, you know, be taken out early. Um, in retrospect, I think that was a really wise move that we didn't, uh, we, we didn't hit that first bid. On the client side, we get, we get requests all the time from big brands. Um, you know, there, there are two big auto retailers that beat the crap out of each other in every market for market share, and they've been the, the most adamant that we don't work with the, one, the other, uh, AutoZone and Advanced Auto Parts. Um, and we've been able to toe that line, albeit ballsy, to say, we're really sorry, but you know our general counsel and board of directors has a policy that we don't give exclusivity to any client within a category. Um, and, and and frankly, and, and from a humorous standpoint, it actually works. So we haven't had to give category exclusivity to any client. Um, and usually, you play the board of directors card, even though that's you know at the beginning was me and my co-founder. Worked like a charm. So. Thanks, John. Any more juicy acquisition offers that we can that we can share? I won't share on the acquisition side, but from an exclusivity perspective. So I worked on the agency side for 12 years of my career, and uh, exclusivity comes up all the time. So we have a famous saying: you pay for exclusivity. And uh, I'm happy to block any single category, but you're going to pay for all the potential lost revenue in that category if you're happy doing that. Be my guest. I think what you know we've got a couple exceptions, and those are categories in which there's not an enormous number of competitors. So Pepsi is a partner with ours. We'll be launching their platform in the next couple months. We just we we know that we will never work with Coke. We're totally fine with that. It's uh, it's actually we don't even have an exclusivity contract with them. It's it's purely an agreement. It's just not something we'll violate. It doesn't make sense to violate. But it's not an industry that has 500 other options. So you choose the one, and you, you, know, you do the best job that you can with them. It's almost like a handshake head start. Sometimes we say to people, like, look, we're not going to, we're going to give you some time, but we're not going to be doing it writing. But sincerely, actually, oh. before you go, okay. just because, I don't know if you saw on the slide, we have Chevrolet and Volkswagen. Um, those two do not like each other, very competitive. So, I mean, you can share a little bit of that. I thought that, that's kind of a funny story. Yeah, they, um, well, they are very competitive, but I was actually gonna talk um, a little bit. It's funny, we don't 
give exclusivity either. Um, and at first, um, it does feel very ballsy, and then they kind of just roll in. They don't question it. Um, and then they'll start to refer you to the other one. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, wait a minute. You just asked for exclusivity. We said no, and then you told the person at the other company that you should work with us. So it's very, very odd. I mean, that's um, we think they're a closed industry. I'm speaking specifically about the, the uh, automotive industry. And then um, they tell all of their uh, people that they used to work with, with other automotive uh, automotive brands, hey, you should check out Promobox. Because so. they might work there someday. And yeah. it's funny, the Chevy story, we went to Detroit and we were like, we were hanging out with them and we're like, don't mention Volkswagen, don't mention Volkswagen. And Andrew, who is our contact, he's from the UK, he's just like, oh, I heard you got Volkswagen. Yeah, I told him to go with you guys. And we're like, oh my God. We were so, we were so nervous. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, I think a lot of it is a bigger deal made of. But yeah. AJ, you got, you got some knowledge you want to drop. Acquisition. Oh, acquisition is interesting. Uh, I was part of. Are you announcing something? No, okay. uh, not us, unfortunately. <laughs> but actually, it's funny. Wildfire got purchased by Google, and that's a big partner of ours. We went through a big vetting process, and we walked the next day and we looked at our founder and said, "Said you got anything?" <laughs> He's like, "What are you talking about?" So, no, it, it's uh, it's kind of answer come back to sometimes. But I was part of Invite Media, which got acquired by Google, and um, for the two founders, it was uh, a very interesting aspect of. They wanted to get acquired by Google, so the, as the aspect was the company was the major focus of it. Um, what they did is they took, I think, around 80 million was the offer they exited at, and they unknowingly capped the whole industry. So at the time, there was Turn, Media Math, uh, Trigon, and all these other DSPs that were around, and they had all raised around $65 million. And with Invite only raising eight and exiting into 80, um, it basically made all the other companies almost non-acquirable. And it still to this day is a very tough situation. So like, I think Turn or Media Math would have to exit at 200 or 400 million. And if you go to like Google and look at all the people who have market caps who would purchase you, there's like 10 companies in the space who have that market cap to actually purchase it. So just from my point of view is that was a, un a brilliant move they didn't mean to do because it created them as a very um, isolated partner in the space. But back to the whole point is you really have to understand the space you're in and the people that might acquire you. So if someone comes to you and asks you for an acquisition, wh what kind of, uh, what will it do to the, your competitors? So if it gives you some exclusivity or if it's a, almost a strategic move about who's trying to acquire you. So it's an interesting aspect of how to look at it. One more audience question and then we'll call it. Hey guys, um, so this is kind of, I don't know, it's an interesting mix that I've seen of um, framing a company in terms of like Raj mentioned to, uh, you know, you specifically want to be or look bigger than you are, which I completely can see where that would be a benefit. On the flip side, a bunch of you have also mentioned that it's a plus that brands will want to work with startups because you're kind of smaller, more nimble, and, you know, to kind of have that going for you. So have any of you found a balance of a way to frame the company, like either say we're bigger than we are or keep it on the smaller startup side, or do you think it's better to kind of keep it neutral and just be assumptive they want to work with you. Yeah, I think the, I think you actually play, I don't know, both sides in a way because there, are, I find at least like there are those who are kind of looking at you. If you're small, they want to see the nimbleness, but then there's that volatility too, right? Where you're trying to manage the two. But I find it whenever I go into certain meetings, let's say in a large organization, you'll, you'll be pegged with different groups kind of seeing you, especially when you go through a diligence process. So the ones who are looking at the numbers or like the lawyers, you want to look as big as you can. Like, oh yeah, I got tons, I'm stable, like all this great stuff. And then when you're talking to the creative person or someone who's actually going to work with you, then you want to, you want to seem small and, and, and very spearheaded and, and very targeted, right? So I think it is a bit of a blend, to be honest. Like website-wise, I always think you got to have some bravado because they can never see what's behind the curtain anyways. But when you're there in person, then you gotta, then you gotta work the show. You gotta know how to move around very quickly. But you gotta, you have to read it. And I, I find with big companies, personal relationships are a huge part of of it. So there is a lot of FaceTime. Like they want to see you. Like I have, I have clients that specifically want to come this week. So I gotta fly back to Toronto to entertain and say hi. I'm real. I'm not just. A, they eventually want to check out to see your space and see who you are and and and, and what you're really about. So, Errol, do you want to? You want to chime in? Is that his question? James Woods, is it? Oh, so I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about James then? Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Any, any other questions quickly before we break? 
that you're dying to know? I, I encourage you, everyone, come talk. I mean, I would say every company on this panel, especially Promobox, will be successful and likely exit. So definitely come and try to feed off the aura here. Um, Winston, AJ, Sincere, Adam, Jonathan, Raj, Errol, thank you guys for coming. I thought this was amazing. Hopefully they have a video of this. If you're a marketing startup or you're a brand, I mean, this is just gold here. So thanks for, thanks for coming to Boston. There is a cocktail hour across the street at Back Bay Social Club, uh, powered by HubSpot, which is a super big startup in Boston. Um, it's first come, first serve in terms of letting people in. So a bunch of us are going to go over there, grab drinks, maybe some food. So uh, thank you, everyone. And again, let's hear it for the panel.